Hi, good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for joining me. Um, for those that don't know me, my name is Anne-Marie Bainton, and I am part of the Live Green Toronto team here at the City of Toronto, and I'm the manager of the Pollinate Teal Community Grant. So thanks for joining us tonight. It's our special presentation of the wild and wonderful world of butterflies with Jessica Linton. And tonight's session is the third in the Pollinate TO Info session series, and it's also the third in our Live Green at Home workshop series. Um, not to mention, it's one of the ways that we're celebrating Earth Day. So before we begin, I'd just like to start with a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge the land we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat people, and is now home to many first, diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. So just a little bit of housekeeping before we get into the presentation. I did want to let you know that tonight's session will be recorded and it will be posted to Live Green Toronto's YouTube channel. And there is an opportunity to ask Jessica questions at the end of the presentation. So if you do have any questions throughout, please enter them into the Q&A box that you see on your screen during the presentation and then we'll get to them at the end. And now it's a great pleasure for me to introduce our speaker today, Jessica Linton. Jessica is a Senior Consulting Biologist for Natural Resources Solutions, Inc. in Waterloo, Ontario. Although she is an experienced general biologist, she has always pursued biological work and education focused on her lifelong passion for butterflies. In 2017, Jessica founded the Ontario Butterfly Species at Risk Recovery Team. She holds a position on the Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada's Arthropod Specialist Committee and is the president of the Toronto Entomologist Association. We are so grateful that she's here with us tonight to share her knowledge about the butterflies and moths that call Toronto home. So please welcome Jessica Linton. Thank you very much for that introduction, Anne-Marie. Um, I assume you can hear me okay. So I'll get started. Um, thanks everyone for attending tonight. Um, I'm always happy to come and talk to groups about butterflies. As Anne-Marie mentioned, they're the group of uh, wildlife that I'm most passionate about. Um, although I do do a lot of general biology stuff, I always come back to butterflies. So today I thought I'd talk to you a little bit about the natural history of butterflies, um, morphology, which is really important in some ways for identifying butterflies and as, as well to get you thinking about how to attract butterflies to the habitat that you create on your property. We'll go over the life cycle of the butterfly. Um, one of the most common questions that I get is whether uh, something is a butterfly or a moth and how to tell the two apart. So I thought I'd touch on that during this presentation. I'll talk a bit about butterfly gardening in general, but also the importance of ecosystem services that butterflies provide. So why you might want to think about butterfly gardening if it's not something you're doing already as part of this um, Pollinate Toronto initiative. initiative. Um, and then ways that you can support butterfly conservation uh, in your own life and in your own community. So just a little bit of background on the natural history of butterflies. Um, they're in the kingdom Animalia and the phylum Arthropoda. So arthropods are a group of organisms that are um, similar in ways that they have segmented bodies, jointed legs, and an exo exoskeleton. So they wear their skeleton basically on the outside of their body, um, whereas we have an internal skeleton. They're in the class Insecta, and all insects have three body parts three and three pairs of legs. Um, other types of arthropods that you might be familiar with are, are uh, arachnids or crustaceans. And then butterflies are in the order Lepidoptera, uh, and Lepidoptera includes both butterflies and moths. But something that a lot of people don't realize is that um, the majority of Lepidoptera in the world are actually moths. So there's about 165,000 described species of butterfly and moth in the world, but only about 20,000 of them are butterflies. So, so the vast majority are actually moths. 
And in Ontario, there's been 167 species documented. So we have the highest diversity of any province um, in Ontario, or sorry, in Canada. And the reason for that is mainly because of um, the geography and climate of southern Ontario. We also tend to get a lot of vagrants or migrants coming into uh, southern Ontario that are kind of reaching just the northern extent of their range. So southern Ontario is a good place to live if you're looking for butterflies in Canada. So as I mentioned, both butterflies and moths, they, or, uh, they belong to this order called Lepidoptera. And the word Lepidoptera actually uh, is derived from the Greek words for scale and wing. And this refers to the millions of tiny little scales they have covering their wings that give them their extraordinary colors. Uh, if you've ever touched a butterfly or a moth wing and got that powder on your fingers, those are actually millions of tiny scales. And so the scales uh, work to produce um, a protective covering on the wing of the butterfly, but also give them their coloration. And evidence suggests that butterflies appeared on the planet over 130 million years ago. So they're well adapted to uh, live here and they've been around for a really long time. So looking up close, I always find pictures like this fascinating. This is um, what a monarch butterfly wing looks like under a microscope. So you can see um, the tiny little scales all over the wings and I attribute them to looking like shingles on a roof. They're all perfectly placed to give the butterfly their colors. And a lot of butterflies and moths have very intricate um, patterns that, that require these scales to be so delicately placed on their wings. It's amazing. Another example, um, looking at the wing of a blue morpho butterfly. So this is a butterfly that's native to the tropics. Um, if you've ever been down to Central or South America, you might've seen a blue morpho or um, they're often um, featured at indoor butterfly conservatories. And you can see the picture on the left-hand side is of a butterfly morpho wing up really close. And it looks like it has these blue iridescent shingles on a roof on its wing. The neat thing about this is that um, there's actually no pigmentation, a blue pigmentation on their wing. And it's just the way that the, um, the, the scales are structured that will cause them to refract blue light, similar to some bird feathers where there's actually no pigment. It's just the way the light reflects off the butterfly. When their wings are closed, they're brown. You can see in the bottom right-hand side there, and they camouflage very well. So totally different scale placement. They also have um, something common that a lot of butterflies have, or uh, we call them oxeli, those eye-like structures on their, on their wing there that confuse predators. Now, if you were to take a butterfly wing and wipe all the scales off their wing, they would actually just be clear underneath. Um, and some butterflies, like this clear wing butterfly, uh, which is also a tropical species, don't develop scales on all portions of their wings, and that helps them blend in with their surroundings. So something really, really neat to see. So as I mentioned, all butterflies um, and all insects have three body parts, a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. Um, butterflies also have two antenna, and they use antenna for smelling. Um, they also have four wings two upper, upper wings, which we call their forewings, and two lower wings, which we call their hind wings. And those are important terms to get familiar with, especially if you're looking at um, identification guides and looking at identifying butterflies. They will often refer to the forewing or the hind wing and the coloration on them, as well as the upper side of the wing. So when the butterfly's wings are open and you're looking down on it, as pictured here, and the underside of their wing. So when their wings are folded up or you're looking at them from underneath. So taking a closer look at this butterfly, this is a morning cloak butterfly. You can see again, <coughs> the antenna up close. Butterflies will always have clubbed antenna. So straight little antenna with little clubs at the end. They have two compound eyes. They also have um, a feeding mouth part called a proboscis. Excuse me. And a proboscis is essentially like a straw stuck to their face. So butterflies can only drink nectar, or sorry, or only drink fluids throughout their adult life. They have no chewing mouth parts at all. And it's essentially like a straw just stuck to their face. And so it doesn't get in the way when they're moving around. It curls up, as you can see in this photo here, and then they extend it out when they want to drink from um, flowers or sap or um, other fluids such as water. Um, one interesting thing about butterflies um, that I haven't figured out the reason for this yet is that often when a butterfly emerges from its chrysalis and it's newly hatched, 
that proboscis or, or drinking mouth part will be split into two pieces and it can't drink anything. It's essentially like a straw split in two pieces that they have to form together in order to use it. And some butterflies never actually achieve that um, and, and might starve to death in their adult life. But if you ever have um, the opportunity to look at a butterfly when it first emerges from its chrysalis, look at its proboscis and you'll often see the butterfly opening and closing its proboscis in an effort to try and work those two pieces of it together. So those are their feeding mouth parts. Um, they also have little feet or tarsus that we call. They have little claws for holding on to things and their feet actually have their taste buds. So when you see a butterfly land on a plant or land on something, it's actually tasting it with its feet. The proboscis plays no part in, in a taste sensory role. So the life cycle of a butterfly. So we're gonna go all the way back to grade one um, biology here. I find this is the thing that got me, I think, most interested in butterflies was this exceptional life cycle they have where they go through four different phases, a complete metamorphosis through their life. Um, and not one of those four phases are morphologically similar um, or physiologically similar really to each other. So it starts the butterfly life cycle, which I've demonstrated here as an example of the black swallowtail butterfly, a common species in Southern Ontario starts with the egg, which is pictured on the left-hand side there. So female butterflies will seek out what we call their larval food plant or host plant, which is a plant that they have a special association with that they lay their eggs on. The egg usually will hatch within five to 10 days, depending on the species, and a caterpillar emerges or a larva, which is pictured at the top of the screen there. So this larva, when it first emerges from its uh, egg is teeny, teeny, tiny, and often the first thing it will do is eat its eggshell for good nutrients, and then it'll go, go on to just eat for the rest of this phase of its life. So a caterpillar um, does have chewing mouth parts, unlike a, an adult butterfly. They have mandibles, and they eat plant tissue primarily. Um, and a caterpillar comes when it's born with a loose skin, and it will eat and eat and eat and eat until it literally is so fat it cannot fit in its skin anymore. And then it will shed its skin and underneath there's a new loose skin ready to be filled up again. And when a caterpillar goes through a phase in its life cycle of shedding its, set, its skin, it's said to be entering a new instar. So if you see a uh, reference to a larval instar or a caterpillar instar, it's just a different size or phase of the development of the caterpillar. Depending on the species, they can have anywhere from like four to seven instars. Um, and the final time it sheds its skin and it's in its last instar, the chrysalis or the pupa will be underneath, which is pictured on the right here. You can see that at the bottom of that picture, the old caterpillar skin is actually at the bottom of that chrysalis. So the caterpillar literally split its skin open on its head and wiggled out of it and underneath was this chrysalis. It's amazing. Now inside this chrysalis is where the most even more amazing transformation takes place. That caterpillar will actually break down into mush and reform into a butterfly. It's an exceptional process. It usually only takes one to two weeks depending on the species. Um, and then you can see the adult butterfly emerges and then the cycle repeats. <clears throat> now depending on the species, some butterflies in Canada only go through this cycle once a year, and some go through the cycle many times a year. It just depends on the species. For black swallowtails, there's usually two to three generations, depending on the length of the season that we experience. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about each one of these phases of the life cycle a little more, because I find them so fascinating. So eggs are something that if you're um, looking at um, building butterfly habitat in your garden, or sorry, on your property or building a butterfly garden, you need to make um, the proper places available for butterflies to lay their eggs on. And it's really fun to go hunting for butterfly eggs as well. You can see they come in all different shapes and colors and sizes. Some are round, some are uh, cylindrical, some have ridges, some are laid in groups, some are laid singly. It all depends on the species. The larva uh, are also varied, and each larva, caterpillar larva, has a distinct look to it, just like the adult butterfly has a distinct look to it. 
Um, caterpillars also uh, are really good food for a variety of predators, such as birds. And so they develop these amazing defense mechanisms over time. So pictured on the top left-hand side, the green and black caterpillar, that's the black swallowtail caterpillar we just saw the life cycle of. And you can see he has this strange orange thing, orange thing sticking out of his head. That's called an osmotarium. And all, sw black, or sorry, all swallowtail species have this osmotarium. And usually it's not visible, it's inside their head. But if you go up and poke uh, the caterpillar or the caterpillar is disturbed, it will quickly arch its back up and flick itself and the osmotarium will emerge from its head. It's quite startling, <laughs> even for a person. Um, and of course, it, it serves to scare off predators, but it also produces a really foul smelling odor. So it's a really good defense mechanism. On the bottom left-hand corner there, we have a giant swallowtail caterpillar. So it also has an osmotarium, but you can't see it pictured here because he's just in a resting uh, phase. The other, uh, great um, the other great defense mechanism this caterpillar has is that he's camouflaged and he looks um, exceptionally like a bird dropping. So a lot of birds um, are not maybe the smartest organisms in the world, but they know enough not to eat their own species. So uh, it's a good thing to look like a bird poop if you're a caterpillar. On the right hand side, we get into um, a little bit more of an aggressive defense mechanism. You can see that some of these caterpillars have spikes, uh, spiky balls. They all look very distasteful, nothing you'd want to put in your mouth. And then the bottom right hand corner, we have the monarch caterpillar, which represents a good example of um, bright coloration. And of course, bright coloration in nature generally signifies toxicity or poison. So the monarch butterfly caterpillar is toxic to um, uh, predators, and so that bright coloring is warning predators not to eat it. When uh, individuals get to the chrysalis phase, they're a little bit more vulnerable. They can't move, they can't fly, um, and so their best defense mechanism is generally camouflage. So most chrysalis have really good defense or camouflage characteristics. The two um, the pictures on the left-hand side are monarch butterfly chrysalis. The one on the far left, you can see that it's a nice pale green color. It blends in really well with the surrounding foliage and then it turns dark, which is pictured on the right hand side there in the middle, right before it emerges. On the far right hand side, there's an owl butterfly chrysalis. And you can see that chrysalis looks a lot like a dead leaf rolled up. Um, exceptionally like a dead leaf. And so, especially in the tropics, you get some really, really great um, uh, camouflaging chrysalis. When the adult emerges from its chrysalis, it's a pretty amazing process to watch. And it doesn't take very long to go through what you are seeing here as a time series photo. So on the left-hand side, the butterfly chrysalis cracks open and immediately the butterfly will start to push its way out. Um, at this stage of its development, it's soaking wet. It's been wet inside that chrysalis. And if it doesn't emerge fully from the chrysalis in about 30 seconds, it will start to dry. Um, however, its wings happen to be folded in there. So it's really important for it to get out right away. You can see that its body is very swollen when it emerges and its wings almost look shrunken like a balloon that hasn't been blown up. That's because the butterfly has fluid in its body that it will pump into its wings and blow them up like a balloon, which you can see if you follow the time series over to the far right-hand side of this photo. Um, that's probably about mm, 20 minutes after it emerged. It's fully formed. Um, its wings are all blown up and it's starting to dry. And it usually has to hang there for a few uh, hours before it's able to fly. So these are just a few examples of the local butterflies um, that exist in Southern Ontario. And most people are familiar with species like the monarch butterfly, they're big, they're showy, um, they have a bit of a famous status. But you would be surprised when you start looking that we actually have a, a really incredible diversity of butterflies. Um, even within the great, like the GTA in the city of Toronto, you can find a lot of butterflies that occupy urban habitats as well as the natural areas within the GTA. Um, these are just a few examples of the 167 species that we do have in Ontario. So when you see something that resembles a butterfly or a moth, how are you supposed to tell the difference between the two? Um, and that's a question I get a lot. As I mentioned before, they're all members of the order Lepidoptera, but there are some distinguishing characteristics that make them different from one another. 
um, which I'll talk about a little bit here. This includes their antenna. So I'm going to show you quickly a picture of a moth. This is a Cecropia moth, and it's it's the largest moth we have um, in Ontario and, and in Canada. Uh, it's part of the Saturnidae family. And you can see its antenna are very large and they look almost like feathers. That's very characteristic of the moth. Whereas butterflies always have straight antennas with clubs at the end. So that's always the first thing I look, like, look at if I'm not sure about whether I'm looking at a butterfly or moth. The antenna can be a really good giveaway. If it, they look feathered, it's a moth. If they're straight with clubs at the end, it's a butterfly. This is a viceroy butterfly, very similar in appearance to a monarch, but you can see on its hind wing, it has a black um, line running from the top to the bottom across its wing. That doesn't happen in a monarch butterfly. So the other thing, um, things that we'll talk about are activity, resting position, body, and pupa. So moths tend to be active at nighttime they're nocturnal, whereas butterflies are diurnal. They fly during the day. Now, there are some moths that will fly during the day, but there are no butterflies in Ontario that will fly at night, um, on purpose anyway. If, if they're disturbed, they may fly away, fly away from something, but, but they wouldn't just be out and about flying at night. That's one of the reasons that their antenna different as well. So um, you may recall, re um, recall that I me mentioned that butterflies smell with their antenna. So if you're a moth and you're flying around at night, you have to rely on your sense of smell a lot more than you can rely on your sense of or your vision. So moths have those large feathered antenna to provide a larger surface area for smelling better. Their bodies are also noticeably different. Generally, moths will have fatter, furrier bodies. And butterflies, although they might have some fur on them, they are generally longer and slender. The last thing that I wanted to talk about how differs is the pupa or the chrysalis slash cocoon phase. So this is the last phase before a moth or a butterfly forms into an adult. Pictured on the top left-hand side of the screen, you will see a cocoon of the Cecropia moth, the one that I just showed you there, uh, that picture that was on my lawnmower in my garage. So a cocoon is something that people often refer to um, when they talk about butterflies, but that's not the correct term when you're referring to a butterfly. A cocoon is something that's only made by a moth, um, and the cocoon refers to the silken enclosure that is over the pupa, which is pictured below. Um, you can see those are two pupa, and you can see the feathered antenna folded down across that will, will eventually form the antenna. So those pupa are formed the last time a caterpillar sheds its skin, very similar to a butterfly chrysalis, except a moth will always form a silken case around it or a cocoon. On the right-hand side is a butterfly chrysalis. So very similar to a pupa that you see in the bottom left-hand corner of a moth, but it never has a silken case over it. So those are the difference, uh, differences in those stages. Both serve the same purpose though in order for a caterpillar or a larva to metamorphosize into an adult. So butterfly gardening. Butterfly gardening is a great hobby to get into if you're interested in looking at butterflies, producing um, habitat on your property. Um, it's a great COVID safe activity you could do at home. Um, and there's a lot of benefits for planting a butterfly garden, especially if you're living in the city. Um, one, they provide habitat for native butterflies and other insects. You may have the intent to build a garden for a butterfly, but you will always find other species of insects in your garden. They're easy to plant and maintain. Generally, um, you know, we recommend that you try to make your garden out of native plants. And the great thing about native plants is that they don't require as much watering as annual um, because they're more adapted to the climate and our soil conditions that we have here. So I'll talk a little bit about how to create and maintain a butterfly oasis right in your own backyard. So the first thing you wanna think about when we're thinking about creating a butterfly habitat is providing lots of nectar. You will recall that I mentioned that butterflies can only drink fluids. Um, most butterflies, their primary source of food as, as adults will be flower nectar. There are some species, especially species you see fly, flying around right now, early in the spring, 
um, when there's not a lot of flowers out that you'll see drinking from tree sap, um, animal dung or urine. If you come across something on a path, you'll often, you can see butterflies feeding on it there. Um, dirt or sand uh, where they get minerals and nutrients from drinking the water. So there are other sources and even sometimes blood and carrion um, that butterflies will drink from, but primarily they, they drink nectar and that's the easiest thing to provide for them in your garden. Planting flowers um, with either clusters of short tubular flowers or with large flat tops. So pictured here, there's um, some monarda, uh, the bee balm, as well as echinacea. Those, if you think about life as a butterfly, they are looking for somewhere that's nice and safe and easy to land on. So these flowers provide a nice landing surface for them. Mixing flowers that bloom at different times of the year is also really important. There are some butterflies that are only flying early in the season, like May and June. And there are other butterflies that will fly throughout the whole season, all the way through till even, you know, September or October, if it's warm enough. So providing flowers that bloom basically between May and October is really important. So there's always a food source available. Planting native plants, as I said, plants that are native to this area of Ontario is always preferable because those are the flowers that the butterflies are naturally adapted to. And providing a mix of color. So butterflies actually see in the ultraviolet spectrum. Um, so they don't see color the same way we do. And visually, your garden would be more attractive to pollinators if it provides a variety of different colors. So in in addition to nectar, so nectar will attract adult butterflies to your garden, but the other really important thing if you want them to stay and hang out in your garden are to provide caterpillar host plants or food plants. So these are the plants that female butterflies will look for to lay their eggs on, and most species of butterfly only have one or a few plants in the same family that they will lay their eggs on. So for example, the most, probably the familiar example to you would be monarchs and milkweed. So monarch butterflies will only lay their eggs on milkweed plants. There are um, in North America, almost 30 different species of milkweed that they will lay their eggs on. Here on Southern Ontario, um, the, the three that they will most commonly lay their eggs on are common milkweed, um, butterfly weed, uh, which is more conducive to sandy soils, as well as swamp milkweed. But that provides, uh, all three of those would provide a caterpillar host plant for a monarch. Planting host plants um, in, in proximity, like bunches of them, is more attractive and easier for them to find. So that's important. I usually provide clumps of host plants, usually two or three together. And then providing some flowering shrubs with twiggy branches are also desirable because that allows the caterpillars to crawl off their host plants and find a safe space that provides lots of shelter. Um, in order for them to pupate when the time comes. So host plants, as I mentioned, um, these are just a few common ones um, that you could think about. So at the top there, we have the giant swallowtail. The giant swallowtail is Canada's largest butterfly. It's very showy, it's very beautiful. And it's a species that's actually expanding its range northward. Um, one, as host plants become available, but also because that we think the climate is warming and it's making it easier for these butterflies to live in Ontario. Their host plants include uh, northern prickly ash and hop tree, but as well on the far right there, that is common garden root. That's not a native species, but it is a species that I put in my garden. It, it's not invasive, it doesn't spread, and the giant swallowtails will lay their eggs on it. This is a species that occurs all the way down to the tropics, and as they move further south, they tend to prefer citrusy plants. The monarchs are in the middle there, I already talked about them. From left to right is the common milkweed. The orange one is the butterfly weed. It's probably my favorite plant. Um, and then on the far right, the swamp milkweed, all really beautiful flowers, and milkweeds really attract a variety of different insects and pollinators. On the bottom there, we have the red admiral, this species is um, a seasonal migrant and seasonal colonist in Ontario, meaning that it establishes colonies here every year, but it doesn't overwinter. But they lay their eggs on stinging nettle. So not necessarily something you wanna plant if you've got little kids running around, but I usually will find a spot for it at the back of my garden. Oops. 
So just to touch on some resources for um, butterfly plant information, there's a t I usually don't go through all of the different options in my presentations because there's so much information out there about our native butterflies and plants that you can plant for them. I put a few resources here, but even just a quick Google search, butterfly host plants in Ontario will get you all kinds of stuff. There is um, the Butterflies of Toronto guide that was put out uh, as part of the Toronto Biodiversity Series, and it's available online, the whole book. That's a great resource. Carolinian Canada, Halton Conservation, Upper Thames River Conservation Authority, the David Suzuki Foundation. And I also found a great blog recently called The Corner Pollinator Garden. Um, and it's a woman who does uh, pollinator gardening in Ottawa, but a lot of the information she posts is really relevant. So there's no shortage of information out there to figure out what butterflies you have in your local area and what plants you need to attract them and get them to lay their eggs. Other things you should consider when you're talking about building a butterfly garden are providing some shelter from the wind and ideally putting your garden in a sunny spot. Butterflies are sun lovers. They want to be basking in the sun. Um, so having it sunny somewhere where it's not too windy is great. You can also think about setting up an area for puddling and people say, what is puddling? Well, when a, a group of butterflies gather together to drink from wet sand or dirt, it's actually called a puddle party. It's a scientific term. So providing um, just even a little dish of sand out in your garden can be great for a lot of species of butterfly, especially the males earlier in the season, they like to drink water from um, dirt or sand because they gather minerals that they use to help infuse their spermatophores, which they then pass on to the females. So there is a biological purpose for them to do that. And of course, don't use pesticides in and around your garden. Um, you know, things like insecticides are not good for butterflies because they're insects. So although um, we talk about the benefits of butterfly gardening in terms of providing habitat for pollinators, Butterflies provide a lot of other ecosystem services. Um, and ecosystem services are the direct and indirect contributions of ecosystems to human well being. And I think this is a really important part of butterfly conservation that I try to touch on in my presentations um, because it's something that I feel really strongly about. So, butterflies provide cultural services. Um, we find them fascinating. They often form part of our education when we're children. These are my kids a few years ago on the left-hand side, Harley and Sawyer, raising a cecropia moth in their backyard. You can see like the fascination and wonder on their face. I find that they've just had the opportunity to learn so much about nature just from having the experience of raising butterflies and watching butterflies in our garden. On the right-hand side is a little boy um, who I photographed at the Monarch over wintering grounds in Mexico. And he was just so excited to show me this butterfly that he had. Um, he was very proud of it. So butterflies can um, form a really important part of um, a particularly, I think, our childhood. People also enjoy butterfly gardening. Um, it's something that you know, provides hours of pastime, it provides educational opportunities, it provides social opportunities to get together. It's a reason for people um, to interact with nature, which I think is really important. On the right-hand side there is uh, my daughter last year. I sent her out to a milkweed patch to get a milkweed leaf to feed our caterpillar we already had, and that's what she came back with. So we had a lot more caterpillars to feed. But again, you can see like the joy that she gets just from um, having that interaction with butterflies. They also provide supporting surfaces, services. So things like pollination, although they're not as important as pollinators as something like a bee or a wasp, they are still providing pollination services. They also feed a lot of other organisms. So during their different life stages, egg, caterpillar, pupa, and adult, they are preyed upon by a variety of different organisms. Some estimate that as little as 10% or less of eggs that are laid will actually make it to adulthood because so many things eat them. Um, as eggs, often ants, spiders will eat them. Caterpillars have all kinds of predators, including birds, parasitic wasps, spiders. Um, on the right, top right-hand side there, you can see a dragonfly who's hunted a fertility butterfly and killed it. 
Um, so they're providing a really important part of the food chain. They also can provide provisioning services. Again, this is a photo that I took at the Monarch Overwintering Ground in Mexico. This is a little area called Sierra Chinqua, and they've built an entire economy around but the butterflies there. Not only are they culturally important to these communities, but they also provide an opportunity for them to um, offer education, tour guiding, there's restaurants set up, um, souvenir shops. So the, the phenomenon of the monarch overwintering there supports their entire local economy. So they're really important um, to these communities. So ways that you can provide um, support to butterflies, people often ask like, what, what can I do besides you know, build a butterfly garden to promote butterfly conservation? Um, there's all kinds of organizations out there that are dedicating resources and time um, to protecting and conserving pollinators. Um, these are just a few of them that I recommend that you check out if you're interested in knowing more. Something local um, that I've been involved with is the Ontario Butterfly Species at Risk Recovery Team. Um, this is a team of individuals, and we've, we're made up of government organizations, nonprofit organizations, academic institutions, and relevant um, private institutions um, that have come together for the common good of supporting efforts to conserve and protect butterflies. So the main initiatives that we're working on right now are um, reintroductions and research on the endangered mottled dusky wing butterfly, which is pictured in our logo here. Um, and that work is supported in a number of ways, but um, in particular through the Toronto Entomologists Association. There's a, a special butterfly project fund set up through the Toronto Entomologists Association. And if you're interested in knowing more about butterflies or getting involved in doing more with butterflies, I'm just gonna skip this, um, there's all kinds of great organizations. So as I mentioned, the Toronto Entomologist Association is a local organization that although the name Toronto suggests that it's in the city, that's just kind of where it has its roots. It's a province-wide organization. If you join, I think it's about $30 for an adult to join, you get um, our newsletter, um, you get the annual summary, and there's a variety of different events um, that happen throughout the field season when COVID restrictions allow, field trips where you get to learn about different insect groups, and as well, we have online talks, so that's one thing you could consider. There's annual North American Butterfly Association count, so if you just Google NABA or North American Butterfly Association, you can find local butterfly counts. Most of our larger provincial parks um, have butterfly counts, Cardinal Var, I think there's a Rouge Valley one, there's also a Long Point one, Point Pelee. And so if you're in those areas when those counts are going on, anybody can volunteer to assist. Um, as I mentioned, you can create and maintain butterfly habitat on your property. One thing, once you do start to observe butterflies, and a really important thing you can do is submit your observations. And there's a number of platforms you can do that through. Um, some examples are eButterfly or iNaturalist. And even if they're common species, that kind of citizen science data uh, contributed is really important to documenting biodiversity and abundance of different species that we have in different areas. You can support organizations that are pollinator friendly, choose native plants and support native biodiversity. And as you learn more about butterflies and pollinators, educate others and share this information with them. So with that, I would like to thank you for your time and attention. Um, I'd be happy to go ahead and answer any questions that you have. Thank you so much, Jessica. Wonderful presentation. And I just have to say the images that you showed, especially of the scales on the butterfly wings, like just wow. Um, and I know a lot of our participants are commenting in the, the Q&A about just how blown away they are at seeing these images. Um, I learned tonight that uh, butterflies have taste buds on their feet and they smell with their antennae. And that's incredible. So thank you for educating me. And I have a new goal for my garden. I want to create and, and have just the right elements to uh, host a puddle party. So I'll mm. be working on that this summer. <laughs> thank you for that. 
Um, so I'm going to jump into the questions, and one of them is specifically related to those amazing images that you showed. And um, some of our Pollinate TO participants um, would like to know if there's an educational resource or anywhere they can access those types of high quality images that they can use to, you know, share with others and, and use for their educational components of their project. Do you have any recommendations? Mm, that's a good one. I mean, there's all kinds of like photos available online. Some of them obviously have copyright restrictions associated with them. Um, but often what I do when I'm looking for photographs of either butterflies or other insects to use in the education and outreach materials that I share is I go to iNaturalist, um, which is the online platform for citizen scientists. And anybody who has an image of something on there, you know, they usually have a name and you can just, I, I've had really good success just messaging people and saying, hey, can I use your photo? And they're happy to share their images. That's a great suggestion. And then it gets you using iNaturalist and contributing your own photos. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, someone is asking what the most common butterfly is in downtown Toronto. Mm, that's a good question. Um, and it probably changes from year to year. Um, it's been a long time, but I actually used to live downtown Toronto. Um, and so in some years, you know, monarchs were really abundant, especially in the fall during migration. In some years, you see a lot more cabbage whites, which are the little white butterflies. They look all white, um, and people often mistake them for moths, but they're not, they're butterflies. In some years, those red admirals that I showed, the migrants that come in and colonize can be super abundant. It all really depends on, um, on a number of factors, but in that one biodiversity uh, Toronto book that I mentioned, if you, you can go online and download it for free, it talks about most of the common butterflies that you can expect to find in the Toronto area. Yes, and I think there's actually an unofficial butterfly named in that biodiversity series book, so I will tease the audience to go and look that up and see mm. what uh, We've deemed our unofficial butterfly. It might give you a clue what uh, can commonly be found here in Toronto. Um, and anyone looking for that, uh, there is a link directly to the Butterflies of Toronto book from the Pollinate TO site. Mm, um, so great. check that out. Um, so thinking about downtown Toronto and thinking about um, the different you know buildings that we we live in, someone is asking about the ability to create butterfly habitat on their balcony. And uh, we had a similar question when we did our bee talk about, you know, how high up will our bees and butterflies fly to, you know, get that uh, valuable nectar? That's a good question. I don't know the exact height, but I do know that I've, I've heard people report to me that they do get butterflies nectaring on their balcony plants. Um, You'll find that the larger butterflies, like the monarchs, they're stronger flyers, they're able to go up higher and probably will venture further for nectar and resources, whereas the smaller guys that tend to get easily blown around by the wind tend to stay lower and closer to the ground. So worth making the effort to, you know, create a butterfly balcony garden and, and know your observations in the iNaturalist. It would be really interesting that to would see be, that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so speaking of nectar, uh, someone is asking, is it true that native plants tend to have a higher volume of nectar than, let's say, compared to um, exotic, non-native, you know, the sort of ornamentals? Mm. That's an interesting question, and it's actually one that I put forward at a research conference I was at um, that was geared specifically towards monarch. Um, because I often see monarch butterflies nectaring on non-native plants, um, like things like purple loosestrife they seem to really like and butterfly bush. And it kind of got me thinking about like either the quality of that nectar um, and if that was as nutritious for them as something that you might find natively. And in a room full of butterfly researchers, no one could answer that question. So I don't think that it's something that's been studied in detail. Um, I think it would probably be difficult to, you know, quantify <laughs> as well, but I don't know the answer to that question, but it is something that I have thought about myself. Um, in general, I don't think that drinking nectar from non-native plants would necessarily be bad for butterflies. I see them do it all the time, but um, there is a reason that certain plants and butterflies evolved hand in hand. So I'm always kind of err on the side of caution in terms of pairing those things together. 
would be great advice. So maybe something we'll see future research on. Mm -hmm. um, someone is asking if you could comment on um, raising butterflies sort of indoors. So we see people collect the eggs and, and raise the monarchs indoors and then release them. Is that something you advise? Is that um, or maybe we should just let things sort of happen naturally? What would you say about that? Yeah, there seems to be, um, you know, often, I, I don't want to use the word controversy, but, you know, I do get a lot of questions about that and some people have varying opinions. My take on it is someone who always raised butterflies growing up, um, I think anything done in moderation and done properly, uh, you know, is something that's worth doing, especially if you have small children. I think that the value of that opportunity to have that encounter with nature far outweighs any, outweighs any risk to the butterfly. Um, monarch butterflies are a species that are protected, protected by the Fish and Wildlife Conservation Act. So technically you are supposed to have a permit in order to raise them. Um, the Toronto Entomologist Association, we actually have a group permit. So if you join the TEA or you're a member of the TEA, you can just ask to be a part of that permit and then you're legally covered to raise swallowtails and monarch butterflies. Um, I think the only time it gets to be problematic is when people are raising really large numbers of um, species and you get into things like potential inbreeding issues or disease. Um, that's when it becomes more of a problem, but raising a butterfly here or there, I think is, is valuable. Okay, good advice. Thank you. I didn't know that you needed a permit for a monarch. So technically you do, yeah. <laughs> Most people don't stuff. have one, but you technically do. Um, we're wondering here in the Q&A about um, any other suggestions that you have for top native plants. So you mentioned um, a lot of larval host plants, um, monarchs and milkweed. Um, and our pollinate TO uh, grant recipients uh, have to plant at least two larval host plants, one of which mm. must be milkweed. So they will all be looking for another larval host plant. Um, so I know you mentioned stinging nettle, which thank you because I have some in my garden and I will leave it now. Um, but any other ones that you may want to recommend um, and maybe their connection to a butterfly that particularly needs our help? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, the unfortunate part about uh, our butterfly species at risk, we have six butterfly species at risk in Ontario. Monarch is one of them, so you're doing a good thing by planting milkweed. Um, another one is a West Virginia white, um, but that species occurs in deep woodland, so it's not something you would tend to find in an urban environment. And then the other one that still occurs here is the model dusky wing, uh, which you're not going to find in downtown Toronto, although there are historical records from Hyde Park. So most of the species you're going to find in Toronto would probably be more common, which is still good. We want to keep them common. Um, for example, the black swallowtails, um, they really like anything in the carrot family. So uh, anyone who's had a veggie garden and had carrot or dill or parsley, you might have seen black swallowtails. And in fact, that's one of the reasons that I grow a lot of those herbs. I don't eat them. I plant them for the butterflies. Um, there are some species like the tiger swallowtails that will feed on a variety of trees. So you could put like a cherry tree in your yard um, and, and they'll feed on that. Um, it really just depends like that slide that I showed you with all those different butterflies, um, you know, they all have different plants. So it just depends on what you want to attract. The, the smaller skipper butterflies, which tend to be not as showy and not as paid attention to, um, usually rely on native grasses. So that's something that's always really good to put in your garden because they often get ignored, the native grasses, but they can be really important for pollinators as well. So something like big blue stem or little blue mm -hmm. stem, is that a good choice? Okay, mm -hmm. great. I was thinking of adding that to my garden. So Absolutely, <laughs> that's yeah. my own personal question. <laughs> yeah. Um, someone is asking what the larval host plant is for cabbage white. And my uneducated guess would be cabbage, but um, please enlighten us. Um, cabbage is one. Anything really in the crucifer family. So I've had them uh, lay eggs on my broccoli too before. Um, they're actually, we only have two non-native butterfly species here. One of them is the cabbage white, um, but it's become a pretty 
established, you know, part of our, our food chain now. Um, but they often are considered an agricultural pest because um, they will prey upon crucifers in agricultural fields as larvae. Um, switching gears here to um, thinking about the fall and, and when leaves fall, um, we get a lot of questions about leaf litter and um, the value to butterflies and moths and, you know, how long should we leave that before we clean up? So I'm wondering if you could just comment on, on leaf litter and cleaning up your garden. Sure. I mean, the best thing you can do is, is not clean it up at all. I know a lot of people have a really hard time with that. Um, but leaf litter can be important for a variety of different um, insects, not just pollinators, um, to spend the winter under. It provides like an insulating layer. And there are some species of butterfly, like the morning cloak, that will just overwinter right underneath that leaf litter and a lot of different moth species. So, and leaving it to the spring as well provides shelter that they need. Some species will overwinter as an egg or a caterpillar, and they don't pupate until the spring. So if you clean up that leaf litter, you've actually removed that from, from your garden, whereas you leave it to the spring. So I, it's really hard. I know it's really hard. You just want to, especially right now in the spring, everybody just wants to be out in their garden, getting ready and cleaning up. But I try to leave all of the leaf litter in my garden until it's well into kind of the growing season. And I mean, leaf litter is really good for your garden. It's like a natural composting material. So um, you can mix it right into the soil. Yeah, that's great advice. And it is really hard to resist that urge to clean up, especially when we have <laughs> these warm days that we've had. But then today, anyone that's joining us from the Toronto area or even the GTA, we got snow today and it's near the end of April. So, you know, keeping that protective uh, leaf litter there is, is actually really crucial. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering if um, you could, there's some questions related to um, the flowers that can grow on balconies. Um, mm. Do you have any advice for specific flowers that might be able to be put in containers? Um, if not, we definitely have some lists on our website that. Uh, yeah, I mean, that might to. be the best resource. I, I would just kind of be bit far and off the top of my head if I had to think of things. But I mean, most native plants are pretty hardy. So anything that doesn't like grow huge would probably be ideal for, for a balcony. Yeah, and then you can always try something out. If it doesn't work, then you know for next year to, to choose something different. But we definitely have container gardening lists on our site oh, for anyone who wants to, to check that out. Um, someone is asking about gypsy moths and the spray that happens every year here in Toronto. And would that impact other butterflies and moths? Yeah, so this is um, something that uh, especially as the chair of the Butterfly Species at Risk Recovery Team, I get asked a lot about, and it's been a hot button topic the last two years because we've had these gypsy moth outbreaks. Um, so currently municipalities use a uh, insecticide called BTK. Um, I'm not gonna try to pronounce the full name of that. Um, and it is uh, a generalized insecticide targeted towards all Lepidoptera, so butterflies and moths. It's not specific to gypsy moth, and it targets the early instar phase of the gypsy moth. So they usually spray in early spring, that's when gypsy moths are in their small larval form. And unfortunately, when they do spray any other Lepidoptera species, a moth or butterfly that's in its larval form uh, will likely be impacted by that spraying as well. Um, they can be quite targeted about spraying, so like it's pretty precise where they do spray. Um, they don't get a lot of drift, but it's not an ideal application, in my opinion. Um, there are, are alternatives um, to spraying that particular pesticide, but unfortunately, the one that I think would work best, which is a virus that's specific to gypsy moth, is not available in Canada right now. It is widely used in the United States, and we were really pushing to try and get it um, ready to use this spring, and it didn't come through. So hopefully next year, but it won't be available this year. So I think um, 
the key things that municipalities uh, need to consider is um, any at-risk species that they have in areas where they would be spraying. That's good advice. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about monarch numbers this year. Every year we hear about um, monarchs making the trip to Mexico and how many, what their numbers are like. And some years it's great news, and other years it's not such good news. Um, I'm wondering if you have any insight on on what's happening this year, what the predictions are. Yeah, so um, the entire northeastern population of monarch butterflies go down to Mexico every year, as you probably are aware, um, which kind of provides a unique opportunity for this population census, because it's not very often you get something that's so spread out, concentrated in a small geographic area. So the way scientists measure the population of monarchs every year is to count the area in hectares that the colonies cover in Mexico. So when you hear like stat statistics like the colony covered two and a half hectares this year, that's like a measurement of the population size. Um, it does tend to fluctuate from year to year, um, but there's been a very dramatic and noticeable downward trend over the last two decades. So sometimes the population you know, is up and sometimes it's down. But in general, it has been making a downward trend for the last few decades. So a few years ago, we got some like really good news that it had rebounded quite considerably. And I was in Mexico actually for the press release and it was really exciting that the population was back up. And then the following year, it was like almost down by half again. So there's a lot of scientists, really great scientists working on the problem right now of what is happening, but um, the question hasn't been answered in full yet. It's likely a combination of stresses on the population, such as loss of breeding habitat, um, pressures on the overwintering grounds, climate change, the list goes on and on. Yeah, a lot of co contributing factors, making yeah. it even more important that we, you know, do the basics and, and grow milkweed and, and nectar uh, producing native plants. Um, we're almost at time, but I wanted to end on, on a question that I hope that you enjoy answering. And the question is, what is your favorite butterfly or moth Ooh. and <laughs> why? Hmm, that's a really good question. Um, I think I would have to say the model dusky wing butterfly, which is uh, Canada's, it's endangered in Canada, but it's Ontario's only endangered butterfly. It's a species that I started studying about 12 years ago. And um, it's the reason that I have been able to spend a good part of my career and my day-to-day -day job uh, doing what I love. So um, I've really come to be fond of the species for sure. I've dedicated a lot of my life to trying to save it. <laughs> that is a good reason that it's your favorite. Um, what, <laughs> what are the larval host plants? Um, that, that. Um, there, there's two species in Ontario um, of, uh, in the genus Ceanothus. One is called New Jersey tea, and one is called uh, Prairie Red Root or Narrow Leaf New Jersey tea. So I wouldn't be surprised if you wouldn't find that species at High Park. Traditionally, it would like, um, like oak savanna or um, open, dry, sandy soil. So it seems like the habitat would be right in an area like that to have it. Okay, great. Well, um, I just want to say thank you so much for taking the time and joining us today. Um, I learned a lot. I know our participants uh, learned a lot. Anyone who has any other questions that I, we didn't have time to get to, please feel free to email pollinateto at toronto.ca or livegreen at toronto.ca. Um, if you'd like to uh, view this uh, presentation again. We have recorded it and it will be posted to our YouTube channel and I will also post it to our Pollinate TO website. So there's definitely an opportunity to see those amazing images again and hear Jessica's excellent advice. Um, so thank you everyone. Special thanks of course to Jessica for being available to us um, and uh, wishing you a happy Earth Day for tomorrow. Thanks everyone. Happy Earth Day. Thank you everybody.